afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, some of our most participatory classes of the year, which is awesome. But if you are new to us, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Everything we do goes to YouTube, so if you want to share this program with your friends and family after, head right there and do just that. Now, today really epitomizes what we're all about as an organization. Earlier today, we hung out with Sonam Lama talking about red panda conservation all the way in Kathmandu, Nepal. An hour and a half ago, I was hanging out with Stanley Anikbogu, a Nigerian entrepreneur in Rwanda right now, bringing LED lights to remote communities and refugee camps. So it's been a really incredible day of stories with some of the coolest people and places on planet Earth. But I'm so excited to have you here today for our third and final speaker to sure. I'm almost done. I can almost dress. It's great. Uh, we are continuing our epic series in conjunction with the early career ocean professional crew here in Canada. If you haven't checked out our webpage with all the ECOP series and our programs to come in the next few months, I really encourage you to do so. The ECOP folks do really amazing work showcasing and celebrating incredible early career professionals in the ocean sphere in Canada. Um, and this has all been made possible by the amazing folks of the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition. So lots of great stuff on the go. Encourage you to check out all those resources, even if you're American, which we've got a bunch of Americans in the audience too. I'm welcoming in Rosie Poirier on the exact opposite coast of Canada for me. I'm closer to North Africa than I am to her, which speaks to how big our countries are here. And today she's going to talk about her amazing role as an ocean storyteller. She's a photographer, a filmer, an artist. She brought, she shines a variety of lights on the incredible ocean ecosystem, uh, its habitats, uh, things that are under threat and things that we can do to help protect them. So I know that's a topic of big interest to a lot of you. I'm going to turn it over to Rosie to take us away. I'm going to stop stealing your thunder. Rosie, welcome to the broadcast for the first time ever. So nice to have you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It was so nice to meet you all virtually. I'm really excited to be here today. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen so that I can show you some amazing visuals uh, for my presentation. So I believe that's up there. Yeah, we still got the slide deck on the left. There we go. Perfect. You're good to go, Rosie. Okay, I'm so excited to be presenting to you today about storytelling to save the oceans. It's easy for me to talk about because it's something that I love so much and I'm super passionate about. So I'm really happy to be here today. So just to share with you a little bit about myself. So my name is Rosie Poirier. As Jesse mentioned, I'm a diver, marine scientist, an artist, an underwater photographer and filmmaker. Here are some of the qualifications that I've amassed over the years just to show you the multidisciplinary nature of ocean science and the ocean world. Um, so I'm going to share with you a little bit of the background work that I've done initially. So in the start of my career, I have spent a lot of time in the field doing field research. That's how my career kind of started off while I was completing my degree and as I was after I finished my degree as well. So one of the major projects that I worked on was whale conservation in the Pacific Northwest. So I'm currently chiming in from Vancouver Island where my work in the field first started. Uh, so I studied primarily orcas and of orcas, um, I focused on human and whale dynamics. So the ways that boater presence and acoustic presence on the water was influencing whales. So I got to work with policymakers. I spent four summers in the field collecting data and seeing whales almost every day. I've also done a fair bit of shark research um, in the Bahamas and in other nations around the world. So I took this picture, so I'm not in it, um, but this is a shark tagging trip where we were collecting population data on tiger sharks, sandbar sharks, and many other species of shark. So the shark that you see in this image is a huge female tiger shark, and she is currently having an ultrasound, as you can see, and she was pregnant with pups. Uh, she was nearly four meters long, and then the girl on the right is extracting blood samples so that we can determine um, information about the food that they're consuming. So in one 10-minute workup of a shark, we can determine a lot of information about their population and their eating habits and uh, a lot of other details as well. So I spent a lot of time doing that. I've also done a fair bit of fisheries research. Um, both in the Pacific Northwest with salmon, as well as in the Bahamas, where I've spent a fair bit of time. The Bahamas, I was mostly doing Nassau grouper and studying their populations, as well as their spawning sites. So we got to go down and dive and put these traps and bring them up and 
attach acoustic receivers to them, which would allow us through sound to determine where the Nassau group were, were traveling. It's an amazing project, a lot of fun. I've worked quite a lot with islands and coastal communities um, especially in terms of marine resource management, the way that they are managing their fisheries and their protected areas, as islands and coastal communities tend to have a lot of ocean surrounding them, and it's really important for them to be effectively managing and protecting their waters. So that's just a quick snapshot to the background of some of the field research that I've done. But truthfully, what I want to spend more time on is the how did I get here? What was the journey? And I think this is so important, especially presenting to school students as you're in elementary, middle school, high school, because you guys are at that stage where you're discovering your own personal journey and trying to figure out what your interests and your passions are. And so I wanna share a little bit about how I got to where I was so that you can imagine yourself within that role and think creatively about how you wanna pursue your passions. So, it all started with one little curious kid who grew up exploring the Great Lakes in Ontario. So I was, I was raised in Ontario, nowhere near any ocean. And I didn't really know anything about the oceans at all. But I did love water and I loved nature and I was curious. But one thing that I did know that I loved was art and writing stories. So I used to paint a lot as a kid and I used to write these little storybooks with illustrations and I was obsessed with nature and I would constantly be drawing and writing stories about animals and the outdoors. But everything changed for me really during my grade eight career project. Um, so we were assigned, everyone within my grade was assigned to do this career project. And we were then going to take our presentations and present them in the gymnasium to everyone in the school who would get to walk through and look at our bulletin boards and learn about the career that we wanted to do. So here I was, I had no idea what career I wanted to do. I was completely blank, no idea, didn't even know where to start, sitting in the computer room stressing. But my teacher thankfully had some resources for us and um, gave us these online career quizzes that we could do. And I did every single one of them. And every single one of them came up with marine biology as my top career. And I didn't know anything about marine biology or the oceans at all. Uh, but as I started research, I became more and more enamored and I was so excited. And I put my all into that presentation. And by the time I was presenting my bulletin board, you would have thought that I wanted to be a marine biologist my entire life because of my enthusiasm and my excitement. And that's where it all kicked off. But in order to have opportunities in the field of marine science, I had to be really creative. So here I was, a 13-year-old, super stoked on the oceans with no ability to come near them. So I had to look for opportunities abroad. So when I was in high school, I started applying for scholarships. And I got this amazing scholarship to go participate in a three week long marine science diving and sailing trip in the Caribbean with a company called Broadreach. And that was the first time I ever swam in the ocean. That was the first time I dove. And I was all of a sudden having this whole world opened up to me. And I came back from that trip changed because all of a sudden this dream of being a marine biologist actually started to seem like it could be possible for someone like me. And so now I was on fire and I kept applying for other opportunities. So then when I was 16, I got this scholarship to go join Students on Ice in the Canadian and Greenland Ar Arctic. And I joined 80 students from around the world as well as from across Canada. And so I got exposed to many other cultures. I got to make friends with a lot of Inuit students from Northern communities who were also on the trip. Um, we spent time going to some World Heritage sites, interacting with the local communities, and especially learning about how climate change and environmental challenges were affecting the northern ecosystems and communities. And this was a huge eye-opening experience for me because it started to give me this global perspective of what, what's happening in the world. So I tried to bring that enthusiasm back home with me because I was still in high school. Um, and so I took every opportunity that I could in school to focus my art and my projects on the oceans. So anytime I was assigned any kind of project in school, I would give it an ocean flip. 
And so when my chemistry class, when I had to do my year end presentation, I made it about ocean acidification. In my physics class, when I had to do my summative and was given a topic of my choice, I decided to do it on the physics of scuba diving. In my biology class, I of course chose to present about ichthyology, which is the study of fish, the biological study of fish. So I was creating opportunity out of anything that was presented to me to be able to learn and to share about the oceans. So I finally graduated high school and was able to take these interests and strengths into the field with me. And I studied marine science and I became a dive instructor as well and started teaching students like the you know, students like me I, as a 15 year old was learning to dive. And it was really incredible to be able to give back in that way and to share my passion as well. So I finished my undergrad and was working quite a bit in the field. But the more I worked within the ocean space, the more I was learning about the challenges facing our oceans. So I just want to touch base a little bit on the importance of oceans to us as humans. So we're intricately connected to their, our ocean ecosystems, even if we don't live alongside them. And we rely on the oceans for key services that typically fall under three categories. This would be provisioning services, which include food that we eat, the way that we transport things across the world through shipping, minerals, fuel. All of these are fall under the category of provisioning services. So these are like tangible, physical things. So when you're eating that sushi or that amazing salmon, then that's a provisioning service from the ocean. Then you have regulating services. And these are a little bit harder to define because this is the way that the oceans regulate the ecosystems as we know it. So providing oxygen, regulating our weather patterns, providing storm barriers. A lot of ocean ecosystems like mangroves and coral reefs provide storm barriers and protect land. And then you have cultural services, which is the way that we interact, learn, play with the ocean, the way that the, inf the ocean influences our culture. And yet, despite the fact that we're so interconnected with our oceans, there are so many threats that are facing our oceans from the way that we are interacting with them because our interactions are, are not sustainable. We've been overfishing, causing a lot of habitat loss. We have ocean acidification that's affecting reefs. We have the warming of ocean temperatures and coastal development, a lot of pollution as well. And pollution is both acoustic from the sounds that we're putting into the ocean, as well as um, physical pollution from chemicals and plastics, like the one that you can see in this image. This is a photo that I took when I was doing a project in Indonesia, and the mantas were surrounded by plastic. And it was heartbreaking to see these things. These are huge challenges that we have to tackle. So here I was realizing our oceans are facing many threats and what we need are large scale solutions. And I wanted to be able to influence solutions. So I ultimately came back to my roots of my original interests and love. I always loved art and I went back and I started painting again and creating more art and sharing this with the world in order to educate about the oceans and to share about the beauty of our oceans. And then I went back to storytelling, which is something that I had always loved. I always loved writing and storytelling had always been my way of interacting with the world. But now my storytelling was through a different lens. It was through the lens of my camera, through filmmaking and imagery and sharing impactful stories. Storytelling is an incredible tool for change. It has this immense potential to move people, to educate, to inspire. And it's important that we that we don't use it lightly because it's it's such a key tool in our society and storytelling has been part of our societies from time it's a it's a way that we learn and share information so now the work that the work that i'm doing now in my career is allowing me to combine my interests into one common goal i get to focus on policy and science through media and art and interacting with different cultures so I have a lot of different stories that I'm currently working on in terms of filming. And some of these are in different, different regions of the world and are covering different topics from fisheries to coastal management. So I'm just gonna share briefly a little bit about these stories so that you can have an idea. So one of the projects that I've most recently been working on is about kelp forest protection 
and management in Baja, California. So Baja, California is a region of Mexico that's directly under California. And this region has historically had huge amounts of kelp forests, but these kelp forests have been declining up to 80 to 95% in certain areas. And this is due to warming sea temperatures because kelp forests require cold water in order to grow, but also due to overfishing, which is a human, a direct community human influence. Because when you overfish the fish that, that um, reside within the kelp forest, then you're shifting the ecosystem balance. So if you're fishing out all the predators of the herbivores, then the herbivores are gonna eat up all the kelp and then there will no longer be this ecosystem. So in this region, uh, the, the areas where community fishers have been managing their coastal ecosystem are the areas where you find the healthiest kelp. So the fishing communities themselves are managing their, their systems, their fishing, and it's allowing the kelp to thrive but not all areas are managed in this way and there's very little government support of these programs and projects. So through the storytelling, we're able to share this, not just within Mexico, but outside of Mexico for other communities that help kelp for us to see an example of effective management and then to also share it for the local government of Mexico to better support these programs. So that's the way that this film can have influence. Um, another story that I've been working on is around um, sustainable fisheries in Canada. So these are actually taken um, just north of Vancouver Island or a halibut fishing boat where they've been integrating some really interesting management practices in order to make the fisheries more sustainable. And more than 2 billion people around the world or around 2 billion people around the world rely on fish as their primary source of protein. So we can't just stop fishing when so many people rely on it. Instead, we need to be incorporating sustainable fishing practices to tackle overfishing. And it's very possible. And it's showcasing these solutions and showcasing what sustainable fisheries look like will encourage more fisheries to shift towards this and will increase the amount of policy that is ensuring that fisheries have sustainable practices. Another project that I've been working on is around storytelling in a remote community in Indonesia in a place called Raja Ampat. And here, um, due to a rise in tourism and from foreign tour operators, there has been um, a lot of sort of like power taken away from the local people and most of the management and tourism is run for by by foreigners and so this project with Mura a local NGO is bringing that resurgence of local involvement in marine conservation and marine management so they're providing education for children and youth and the villages that live within Raja Ampat and as well as capacity building for women. And so they're teaching women to dive, to snorkel and to monitor their reefs and teaching communities how to develop their own internal structures for managing their coastal, their reefs surrounding their islands. And they've been having huge success. So sharing this story is helping gain funding for their programs because they need a lot of resources. They need dive equipment, they need snorkeling equipment, they need teaching materials. And so through the story, we're able to bring resources to their projects. So just to share a little bit about the purpose of, of storytelling for direct action, stories have the potential to bring all these resources um, to a project. You can bring resources, funding, political support, expertise, connect projects together, build collaborations through sharing stories. And that's what impact storytelling is all about. And that's the type of storytelling that I focus on. And so the per impact storytelling ensures that learning, organizing, educating, and advocating is at the core of storytelling and that it affects change in public attitudes, behavior, culture, and policy. So I just wanted to share this story in this way because through my journey in the ocean field, I learned that you don't have to be a marine biologist to work in the ocean space. Because me at 13 during my career project, I was learning about the oceans and I was so excited to discover marine biology. And for a long time, I thought that marine biology was the only way that I could contribute to the ocean space. But as my career has grown and developed, I started to learn that there are so many other opportunities to be involved in ocean science or to contribute to the ocean space. 
and that in reality, the oceans need everyone. They need so many advocates and they need advocates from so many different fields. We need lawyers who are passionate about oceans, who are going to be pushing for policy that promotes conservation and, and effective management. We need teachers who are passionate about educating about the importance of oceans. We need business owners who are designing their businesses sustainably so that we have healthy oceans for the future. We need fishermen who are on board, who are passionate about sustainable fishing. We need engineers who are designing systems that last. So really the ocean space is for everyone and oceans are for everyone. And that was one of the most important things that I learned through my career journey. So before I pass it off to questions from the audience, I actually have a few questions for you guys because part of the purpose of sharing my story in this way was to show how you can, you don't have to wait until you're grown up to pursue your passions, that there's always creative ways for you to explore your passions today. And so I wanna ask you so that you can ask yourselves, what are your strengths? What are the things that you are interested about? And then how do you direct them towards your passions? And how can you think outside the box when it comes to your interests so that you can create opportunities for yourself today? And with that, that's the summary. And uh, I think I'll pass it to Jesse. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Rosie. What an incredible journey you've been on. Geez, and you're and so much more to come. Um, I want to stress for our classes, and I like to highlight this every time we have someone who's an early career scuba diver. For our students, we've got a lot of grade threes and fours today. When you're eight years old, you can start on the path of being a scuba diver. So if you want to end up with like a life in the ocean or even just a really cool recreational opportunity, Patty Bubble Maker is like the first sort of breaths you can take underwater. I can't encourage it enough. It took me till I was like 27 to become a scuba diver. It is like black magic. It's the coolest thing you can ever do. And maybe you turn into an amazing career like Rosie. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, we're going to dive in with our live classes in a minute. YouTubers, please share questions there. Ms. Becker, I'm going to head to you guys in California to begin. But first, you, you showcase some really beautiful art that you created. And I'm so curious for our students who might be taking part in our art contest, who might never have picked up a pencil or crayons or art materials of any kind. How do you get started with art? Like, is there a, can you do art badly? Is there something you'd recommend? What's our, our call to action here? <laughs> That's such a great question. I love it because you have to do art badly in order to do art well. And the truth is that everybody is an artist. And when we put so much pressure on ourselves for things to come out and look a certain way, then it keeps you from even allowing yourself to be creative. So the most important thing is to put that pencil to paper, to put that paintbrush on the canvas and to try. And for me, like my initial art looked bad. It looked really bad. And for years, I didn't improve at all because I was painting like once or twice a year. But when I started painting consistently, it was amazing the improvement that I was seeing. So with a lot of things, it's important to practice. And it's the other side of it too is, is just to let yourself create. Because at the end of the day, creativity is about you enjoying the process, putting that those ideas on paper. And half the time, my paintings don't turn out how I anticipated anyway. But I still love them. <laughs> I love it. And it, it's something that uh, speaks to, again, earlier today, we were talking with an innovator, someone who's like creating cool robots and technology. And he's like, most things that I do fail. Like <laughs> you just keep trying and you do it and you get better and better. And I think that iterative process is really important for our kids to understand. So thank you for that, Rosie. And, Incidentally, if people want to check out more of your art, you've got a fantastic Instagram page. I'll make sure all our classes have this at the end, but some really top-notch stuff there that's just mind-blowing. So you can see how good you get when you keep failing over a long period of time like Rosie. Miss <laughs> um, Becker's class, we're going to head to San Diego. If you guys want to come on in and ask a question, unmute your mic and you are good to go. Hey. Oh, are we frozen? I think we might be with Miss Becker's class. You guys were good when we started. Okay. Miss Becker's class. Send me a message in the chat and I'll share it with Rosie in a minute, but we'll head to Miss McIntosh as well. We're waiting, okay? Best of luck in San Diego and we'll go to Miss McIntosh's class to fill us in, Tribune Drive. Hi. Hi, I'm, I'm, hi, I'm Dev and my question is how many years did it take you to become a marine biologist? <laughs> um, let's see. I feel like it's hard to say when it officially happens because there's not like a moment where someone's like, you're a marine biologist now. But I would say from when I started being interested in marine science, it probably took me about eight years between age 13 and age 21, 22 to finish my degree and to officially be working in the field as a scientist. 
which sounds really daunting. I always like when we get this question, but it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm in grade five. And the thought that there's like, you know, 12 years plus of school left is like, ah, but you end at the end of that and you're really young and you get to work with amazing people and you get to do what you love. And it, trust me, it goes faster than you think it will. So for our students that might be yeah. alarmed by the thought of being in your twenties, it's okay. It's good. Um, Pelham Elementary, I'm going to come to you guys in just a minute, uh, but Abigail West, Miss Michael's class, grade threes, come on in if you've got a question for us. And Go ahead. Take us away. Uh, Mackenzie has a question. When you have food on your boat so you can eat, do any fish or animals try to get your food on your boat? <laughs> That's really funny. So if you drop food overboard, a lot of fish will be right there to eat it, especially in areas where they're used to boats. But um, the animals that I've seen be the most aggressive about wanting the food on your boat are sea lions. They'll follow your boat inshore and try and jump up on it so they can get some fish, especially if they think you're a fishing boat. Uh, so yeah. sea lions are pretty much universally regarded as like the rascals of the ocean. So uh, you're not the first person to mention them as like the interlopers on in many a scientific voyage. So thank you for that. Yeah. Um, tell them, I'm going to come to you guys in just a second. If you want to undo your mic, uh, if you guys have questions, I know you're grade one. So let me know and you can flick that on. Ms. Becker's class wants to know, can you be a marine biologist or be in the field that you're in if you don't like water or like to swim? Yes. So most people, maybe some people would think it's no, but most definitely. So I have from some friends who work entirely in the lab and they study only oceans, but they love the lab work. Personally, I prefer to be in the field, um, but there's also ways to be in the field without swimming at all. So when I was doing my whale research, I never step, I was never inside the water. I was always on a boat. Or you could be doing that same work from land as well, doing observational studies from land. You don't have to go in the water. You don't have to swim, but you can still study the oceans and be a marine biologist. I'm glad well, I'm going to put, pick out some nuance here because lab work is very much on land. But I find it interesting, not just with kids, but adults too. Uh, the thought is that if you're on like an oceanic research vessel, that you need to be a swimmer. If you're on the boat and you need to swim, things have gone very wrong. So it almost never happens that you're on a ship and you have to swim. Uh, most people on those ships are, are there. They're on board the ship the entire time. They walk on a gangplank off to the shore at the end. So uh, if, you, if you're if you afraid of the water, you can still end up with a really, really cool job in the field. I like that question very much. Um, Pelham Elementary, come on in, guys. Ms. Gonzalez's thoughts. Unmute your mic, and you're good to go, first graders. Hi. Uh, my name's Aika, and you and do any of you like ice cream? And what did you like the best to do when you when you were scuba diving? Nice. <laughs> Oh my gosh, the first question is so important. Yes, I love ice cream, especially Moose Tracks ice cream, which I think is Canadian. Yeah. Um, the second question, I think you said, what do I like most about scuba diving? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I I love the feeling of being surrounded by water. Because for me, I always see the oceans as this, what connects us to the rest of the world. Like the oceans are connecting the whole world together. So when I'm in the ocean, I feel like I'm connected to the world. And I love that feeling. What a nice sentiment. I love that very much. And you've kept our trend going of, of I want our classes to know, scientists, explorers, storytellers, everyone we have on this broadcast, pretty much universally when the ice cream or chocolate question gets brought up, we're all real big sweet tooth people. I mean, it's just, it's delicious. If you find it delicious, you can also end up in a cool role like Rosie. So I'm, I'm at the first we've ever gotten that specific question. Thank you, Pelham Elementary. I appreciate that. Um, Ms. McIntosh, we're going to head back to you live. YouTubers, don't be shy. Feel free to share there. But we're going to do one more round of questions. Ms. Becker, you will have to share in the chat. Your connection's a little iffy today, unfortunately, but... Come on back in, Tribune Drive. Hi, I'm Ms. Lewis. Okay, how can we protect the oceans? Oh, could you repeat that? We sort of modulated you out. Your audio cut out a little bit. I said, uh, my name is Lucas. How can we protect the oceans? Yes. Oh, that's such a great question. And there are so many different ways that we can protect the oceans. And that's what makes it a really exciting space to work in because depending on your strengths or what your interests are, you can contribute those to ocean protection. So in our everyday lives, there's a lot of things that we can do uh, by not using, reducing how much we use plastics and walking to school and things like that. But also in terms of um, the work that we do and sharing information, especially for you in your classrooms, you can be educating one another about ocean topics. Um, 
and then as well sharing like important petitions and things like that but then through your interest through like if you're really interested in science then you can find projects within the science world that allow you to contribute to ocean protection and there's a lot of um citizen science online as well either if you live in a coastal ecosystem then you can find ways that you can um, record what you observe in the oceans in these apps um, and contribute towards citizen science or there's also ways that you can sign up to um, uh, review like video data online for scientists so there's a there's a bunch of websites around that um, so even as a young person in school you can find ways to contribute so I'll have to dig up some links for that but there are loads of ways that you can contribute I'm trying to get all the links as quickly as I can. The Breed Tracker, something that we've used extensively in our classes that have loved over the years, is a great tool that you can use to actually contribute to real people working to clean up the oceans, understand our plastic impact on it. Zooniverse I put up, which is just like the best one-stop shop for all citizen science. But I'm really glad you threw in there, signed a petition, which classes you've probably been involved by your teachers to sign things before. Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants got it start doing that. Like literally before I was even involved, the teacher who created this, his class wrote to Western Australia, like 12,000 miles away to highlight that they didn't want them to kill sharks there. And it made international news. Like that was before Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants got big. So the nice thing, Rosie, is like kids these days, you have so many inspirations of kids that are not much older than you, 16 year olds that are marching in groups of 500,000 to lead the charge for conservation and against climate change. And I mean, it's, I think everyone thought it was going to be our generation. You're younger than me. Everyone thought it was going to be my generation. We sort of, eh, we did okay. And like everyone who's come up has just done so, so much in the last few years. Like it's the best time ever to be a student interested in these topics. So thank you for highlighting that, Rosie. Yeah. Um, let's head to Illinois. I'm going to head to you guys. And then we're going to take ones from Miss Becker and Pelham Elementary to wrap up. Come on back in, grade three. <laughs> Um, what was the longest time period you were in the water? Ooh. Oh, wow. The longest time I spent underwater um, was probably a two hour dive. So I spent a lot. If I were to cumulatively attach all the time I spent underwater together, it would probably be like a month worth of underwater time. But wow. my longest dive was probably two hours. Cool. So yeah. I saw on your first slide, our, our students might not be familiar with the certifications, but you're cave dive certified, tech dive yeah. certified. Um, is there anything you have yet to get for our students that might not know that you want to get in terms yeah. of certification? Um, let me think. I have done, I, I upgraded a lot of certifications this year um, right. through a scholarship that I completed. And that's where I got to my cave diving, my tech diving. But I would really love to dive under the ice. I think that that's like. We had Jill Heinerth on not too long ago. She's like the world's leading cave diver, technical diver, and talked about diving in Antarctica inside icebergs. So if you want to follow up on our YouTube channel and check out some ice diving and why Rosie might want to do that, I can't encourage that enough. It looks just <laughs> absurd and so cool. Yeah. Um, Miss Becker's class, they want to know what about the ocean particularly sparked your interest and how far away did you live from the ocean when you were little? So they're in San Diego. They live right on a beautiful coastline. Uh, where were you and what's the main driver? <laughs> That's amazing. You guys are so fortunate to grow up near the ocean because I really didn't at all. Um, I lived at least a th about two to three day drive away from the ocean or a few hours flight. I grew up in Ontario near Toronto. So it's about as far away from the ocean in Canada as you could get. Um, but what about the ocean sparked my interest? Um, I think as a kid, I was always obsessed with nature. Like I loved animals. I loved to go to the forest and feed the chipmunks. I loved to like sit by the pond and look at the frogs and catch tadpoles and all of that type of thing. And I love to swim. So even though we didn't have oceans, we have the Great Lakes where I grew up. And the Great Lakes are quite big. And sometimes they look like an ocean. And people who come, they're surprised that it's not. But they're fresh water. And we used to go in the summer and we would swim in the lakes. And I loved swimming, never wanted to come out of the water. So when I was doing this career project and learning about marine biology, I was just mind blown because I felt like I was learning about something that was combining all my interests together. And I didn't even know that that existed. And that's what really sparked my interest. Very, very cool. I grew up in Toronto. It's a law on Lake Ontario. We had someone come from Vancouver Island not too long ago and visit. And she's like, this is just an ocean. Like it's just, it's 300 kilometers by like 30 kilometers. Like it's a huge lake. It's an unfathomably large lake 
for any of our students that have never been to one of the Great Lakes. They're a special, special place. But I must say, even growing up there, nothing quite beats the ocean. It's a it's an incredible opportunity you guys have. Hello, Massachusetts. I'm going to come back to you guys, grade ones, for more great questions to wrap up in just a minute. But I do want to stress again, uh, this is an incredible opportunity that we have with the early career ocean professionals across Canada, our second of five broadcasts. If you want to check out the whole page, do that below. They do such great work here. And Rosie, you mentioned the scholarship a couple of times. Um, the Our World Scholarship is just an incredible opportunity. A uh, great website if you want to learn more about that. Students on Ice, you mentioned, which is an amazing project that a lot of the students that we've uh, featured in these broadcasts in the past have been on. So you just had an incredible early career. It's, it's been so much fun having you. Um, Pelham Elementary, I'm going to stop talking. Come on in for one final question. And we'll wrap up from there. Hey, guys. Hi. Very loud, very loud. Hi, Molly. Have you seen any octopuses? Oh, Ms. Gonzalez, could you repeat that for us? Have you seen any octopuses when you're a scuba diver? <laughs> nice. I have. And I wonder where your curiosity for octopus came and if you've seen the movie My Octopus Teacher because it's beautiful. But I have seen some octopus um, and sometimes they're really hard to see because they hide in little holes. But sometimes you get lucky and they come out and you see the entire octopus and they're really beautiful because they change color underwater and I've gotten to see that with my own eyes. Oh, that is so cool. You're one of the only people that's ever mentioned the uh, changing colors. So thank you for that. And uh, if our classes haven't heard or checked it out, My Octopus Teacher is really accessible to all ages. It's an amazing film. Uh, one of the best natural history things done in years. So do check that out when you're done. Rosie, uh, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we bring in all our classes to say a big over-enthusiastic thank you and farewell, is there any last message you want to share with us about your life in the ocean? Anything we can inspire them to lead them off with today? <laughs> Um, I think just reiterating that the ocean is a space for everyone. So no matter what walk of life you come from, what your career path is, if you're from the coast or not, the ocean is for everyone. And so it's for you to explore. And uh, also a reminder for you to explore your passions creatively now and today. Amazing. Rosie, thank you so, so much. I'll make sure all our classes have all these amazing links to learn more about you and your amazing work. Uh, but as I said, when we wrap up every broadcast, we're going to bring in Pelham Elementary, Miss McIntosh, Miss Becker, Avika West. If you guys want to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell to Rosie, you are all in the broadcast. Unmute your mics. Thank you so much, guys. And have a wonderful yeah. rest of your day. Bye. 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 Bye.